So, force versus time graphs, page 283. So, the reason for doing this, we're going to determine the impulse from the area under a force time graph, and we're going to include constant positive and negative force, and a uniformly changing force. So, just from this graph here, which I don't think you guys have, I just sort of pulled this off online, so I just thought I had a graph. Um, if we're going to have constant positive force, well, that would be that segment right there, wouldn't it? Would be constant positive. Constant negative. Do I have constant negative on that graph? I do not. But if I did, it would be like this, right? And if it was uniformly changing? Sure. If it was uniformly changing force, well, that would be any of those, really, right? Kind of thing. And um, again, you've seen all this already before, so it's just that area of calculations. Okay, so the basic idea, once again, you have a constant force, and if you want to write this down, you can. If you want to sit back and enjoy, you can. I'll be posting these, of course, later. If a constant force acts over a time, the basic graph will look like this. Notice that I said constant force, right? So the force remains constant throughout. So you can see a graph like that. And force multiplied by time would be the area under the graph, right? Because this would be the length. This would be the width, and you, that would give you, oops, I guess that would be a capital. Force multiplied by time would give you the area, right? And we already know that impulse is defined as force multiplied by time. Therefore, using this logic, the area under graph is defined as the impulse. Okay, same reason as the area under a force times distance graph is defined as work. Same idea. In most cases, though, the force is not constant. And it increases as colliding objects are compressed together. Okay, So as I swing my golf driver, uh, it compresses the golf ball. And the force will increase. And then as the golf ball reaches its maximum compression and then begins to expand again, then the force actually decreases. And so you would actually get a graph very similar to that. Okay. And I think you guys have that right on your sheet there, right? Yeah, and it's on page 283 as well. Okay. Or they've got a guy, a guy kicking a rugby ball there, kind of, right? Um, again, though, the area under the graph is equal to the impulse. Okay. Just like in this case here. So in this particular case right here, how would I find the impulse? Well, it would be the base. That's a, it's a triangle now, right? So my impulse J is one half the base times the height. The base is from 0 to 1.2. The height is all the way up to 25. Do they do the calculation in the book there? They do. They got 15 Newton seconds. Remember the unit for impulse is Newton seconds. So this works for um, irregularly shaped graphs where the force is not constant. Same idea, area under the graph. Uh, this is above zero, so that would be positive, which just means that it's to the right. That's all it really means. Some questions? Are we all good there? Okay, so here's example number four. Determine the impulse for each of the given graphs. If you want to flip the page in the book, we're now on page 284. Here we have a stretched elastic band. It applies more force than a limp elastic band. The applied force is decreasing over time as the stretched band returns to its relaxed state. Now you'll notice that the elastic, the, the force does not go all the way down to zero. So how do I find the area or the impulse in this particular one? You've got to break it into two parts, right? You could. There, the, it is actually a trapezoid there, but probably the easiest way to do it, and you saw this on the last test, right? Find the area of the rectangle, find the area of the triangle, right? So half the base times the height plus the length times width. So the base of the triangle is from 0 to 1, a distance of 1, and the height of the triangle is from 20 to 70, which is a height of 50. So you got a half of 1, times 50, 25, 
and then the length times the width of the rectangle here. So again from 0 to 1 and the width would be from 0 to 20. Giving us an impulse of 45 newton seconds and again it's positive because it's about. What if you've got something like this? Have you guys seen a bell curve before yet? Stats class? Yeah? What is a bell curve, Brandy? Yeah, kind of, yeah. Okay. So here we've got the varying force of a tennis racket on a tennis ball. The force increases and then decreases over the time interval. So it's very similar to that. Very similar to that triangle idea here, except that it's got a bit of a curve to it. In fact, it looks to me to be like a bell curve, which I am not convinced this would be actually what you'd get if you hit a tennis ball with a tennis racket. But anyways, um, if you go back and look at what the outcome said at the start, it said include constant positive and negative force and uniformly changing force, which means that it's changing at a constant rate, which means the line must be straight like that. Is this a straight line? No, this is non-uniform changing and not required for me to show you. But it is in the book. But I will take a, I'll just take a few moments and I'm, you're not going to be tested on this. You don't need to know it, but I'm just going to give you sort of a future heads up the calculus kind of thing, right? So yeah, you can solve by estimation, which is what the textbook actually suggests. The copy didn't really work so good. In fact, I think I maybe didn't even copy it for you. But on page 285, you can see they've got that bell curve there. And you can see that they've got, sometimes they've got it like this. Sometimes it's above. You see like, do you see it like that? I might be getting it kind of wrong here. Sometimes the rectangle, there's little bits and pieces that are above. And then sometimes there's bits and pieces that are actually missing. You see that on the graph there in the, in the textbook? Okay. And the idea of calculus here is that enough of the ones that are just above will balance out with the ones that are below that it works out to being even. And that's even more so if you actually make these even smaller like so. Okay, the thinner you make the rectangles, the less overlap you have, and eventually that overlap is basically nothing. Okay, so that's a, a key idea in the idea of integration. And if you're taking advanced math, you'll, you'll run into that. But for us, don't worry about it. Okay? Good. Okay. So yeah, I, like I said, I didn't have a lot for you today. On page 287, there's a couple there to do. Uh, number six, and did I copy those for you? Oh, did I not do those? That was silly of me. Look on the front. Is it on the front? Okay, well, you'll have to do page 287, number six, A and B. I guess I'll have to add those onto my sheet. And then on page 308, those must be the ones that I photocopied for you, right? 287, number 6, A and B. Don't do C. Why not C? Because it's curvy. If you want to try it, basically you're just going to do an estimation thing there. And then on page 308, uh, number 50, A, B, and C. 50 and 51, I guess. Those are on the your sheet, right? Okay, I'll have to add those other ones. So. so you can spend some time doing that if you want to work on stuff from yesterday. If you have anything to clean up from your video, you can use today's period for that. I'll be starting tomorrow. Hopefully everyone's here, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Tomorrow I'll be starting with conservation of momentum, which is sort of the big idea here in this unit.